So, as Ralph said, I'm, I come from a place which, for many of you Varsovians, is a more foreign land than the story we heard from Papua, Papua New Guinea. <laughs> so, so, bear with me. For most people, when they think of Jewish life in Krakow, they think of something like this, in a good sense. This is a positive way that they might think about it. Something like this. People going about their business, of course, pre-war. These are the images that the world, Jewish world, non-Jewish world, thinks of Poland, Jewish Poland. And in the majority of the cases, or in a, probably a worse sense, like this. But when I go to work every day in Krakow, what I see is something more like this. The road from black and white to color will take us a little while. Um, I have to do a little bit of history before. Won't do too much. Um, we won't go into Jewish history before the war because it would definitely exceed the 18-minute regulation as Jews in Poland for 1,000 years, in Krakow for 700 years. So we'll go after the war. Of course, three and a half million before the war, 90% killed. 90% of Jews killed. Majority that, stay, that left, 10%, about 200,000, give or take. More than half left between 1945 and 48. 1957, a few years after Stalin's death, you had a loosening up of things. About half the Jews left state. Half the Jews left and half state. 1968, and this for us is a very important time in terms of the Jewish question in Poland. The people that stayed until 1968, they had the opportunity to leave. In other words, Jews, and certainly in 57 or after the, before, after the war, could have gone, and these people stayed. In 1968, you had after the Six-Day War and after the student riots, which, of course, any time students are rioting or people doing bad things around the world, obviously it's the fault of the Jews. So we had a, let's say, forced emigration from Poland in 1968. And this, for us, is very relevant in terms of building a community today because of not only the people who left, which was the majority of people, majority of Jews who wanted to live as Jews, but the people who stayed, stayed because they didn't want to, they, their Jewish identity wasn't the most important thing to them. Or, it was generally mixed couples. If people, two people were working, 1968, very often they both lost jobs. So the people who could stay, who even had the opportunity to stay in Poland, who weren't forced to emigrate, were really those with a weaker Jewish identity. Also, one day somebody's a doctor, the next day go back to work and they find themselves cleaning the hospital, sweeping the floor. So this is the situation in 1968. People who stayed, stayed because they didn't want to live openly as Jews. This was their identity, their Polish identity was much stronger than their Jewish identity. And it was just something that wasn't at the forefront of their life, the forefront. In terms of children, and I think this is very relevant, is that they pushed their children underground. If you chose to stay for whatever reasons in 1968, you did so and you raised your children not as Jews at all. In other words, not, not only with a strong Jewish identity, but perhaps the children don't know that they're Jewish. 1989 happens, nobody expected it. Of course, it seems like Ronald Reagan knew all along, but he might have been the only one. Suddenly, people are allowed to, more or less, if any of us are, be what they want to be, explore what they want to explore. And this 50-year war, really, that was in Poland between 39 and 89 is now over, and people can talk about whatever they want to talk about. And one of the taboo subjects, one thing that people didn't talk about really before that was, of course, the question of Jews. After 1989, you have some organizations that come into existence. When we look at these organizations, we're essentially talking about a very small amount of people, maybe a few thousand at most in all of Poland, majority in Warsaw. In Krakow, you're talking about an official community after 1989, maybe 150 people, which is tiny, nothing, really. The reason Warsaw, Warsaw uh, was, most of these organizations really came into existence in Warsaw and were much stronger in Warsaw, I think that for me, there's a nice quote by someone, local Krakowian Jewish historian who passed away recently. He said that in Warsaw, the Jews became communists, 
and in Krakow, the Jews became Catholics. And it's an easier path back from communism than from Catholicism. <laughs> so, I don't know. So now, after 1989, we have these small institutions, these kind of older people that are involved. But suddenly, people that are interested, that hear stories from their grandparents, find something in the cupboard, strange photos of people that look, look like we saw these photos before. And they're starting to explore things and starting to look around. Also at this time, you have a Jewish cultural festival, which began right before 1989, which is now in its 20th year, where people come to Krakow. And if you haven't been, I strongly suggest it. Um, which people are celebrating Jewish culture. You have a museum a few years later, the Galicia Jewish Museum that opens, and you have a center for Jewish culture. Everything Jewish is trendy and interesting. People are exploring the Jewish question. It's fascinating. The one thing that's missing from what people call a Jewish renaissance is, of course, the thing that in many ways is, is I would say, necessary for a Jewish renaissance, which is, of course, Jews. So, not so easy. Now, people that came of age after 1989, students and what have you, these are people, not so, they weren't as burdened by the past. In other words, they weren't pushed away from the whole question of their identity, Jewish identity, by their parents. So you have people that were older, and then people people who were Jewish, too old not to be Jewish, let's say, and you have students who are curious and into finding out about their identity and were able to explore their, their Jewishness. But in the middle, there's really something lacking. And this is the situation we find ourselves in, or we found ourselves in, I should say. Now, how do we get from this to a Jewish community center in Krakow? Prince Charles, obviously. How <laughs> The photo is not necessary. You knew the answer already. <laughs> what is Prince Charles doing? What is his motivation to get involved in a Jewish community center in Krakow? If any of you know, then you know better than I do, because I have no idea. <laughs> what I do know is the story, though. In 2002, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales was in Krakow as part of an official visit. He met with some older Jews from the community, was moved by their story, which we just went through a little bit. Um, and wanted to do something to help. He went back to England, got, back, got in touch with a charity called the World Jewish Relief, who during the war did the kinder transport you know, under a different name, got a lot of uh, Jewish children out of uh, Europe, saved them. And he presented his idea. Well, you don't really say no to Prince Charles, of course. Well, not many people do. Um, but they did say that why not do something a bit more forward-looking? Instead of a retirement home or a center for these older people, which is the community at this point, let's build a community center and do so, something more forward-looking. Prince Charles agreed, fair enough, and there we go. I should tell you this is not a horrible act of anti-Semitism. He was only, <laughs> only showing the hammer to Chief Rabbi of uh, Galicia, Edgar Gluck. So we fast forward to this nice day, April 29th, 2008, a year and a half ago, almost two years. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall, which is the official title of Camilla, came and opened the center. Now, we have a center, we somehow, which to be honest, only was built because of Prince Charles' involvement. Nobody else, certainly not in the Jewish world, really had much faith in the future of Krakow. People in Warsaw, of course, why isn't it in Warsaw? Well, not, not everything has to be in Warsaw. <laughs> so, we have this center. There's a lot of good feeling, um, you know, in terms of the pop local population. Everybody's interested in Jewish life. I should say there's a strong Jewish studies department in Krakow. You have 200 students getting a master's degree at any time in Jewish studies, almost none of whom are Jewish. So, all the elements are there. Again, we need Jews. There's the building, very nice. Took, by the way, Prince, had, Prince Charles' architect had to go over all the plans and agree. It's probably why it took five years to build it. So what do we do at the center? How do we find these Jews that we know are out there? It's not possible that you have three and a half million before, Jews before the war and there are 5,000 in, in Poland. It's just not possible. And again, for us, when we say Jews, we're not talking about necessarily somebody who, according to Jewish tradition, has a Jewish mother. For us, any kind of background. Maybe not background all the way to Adam, which would make all of you Jewish as well, but going back a little bit. So we try to be very open, very warm, welcoming, non-scary place. Again, when most people have, most Poles have this image of Jews in their head, it's before the war. 
this very strong pre-war image. And a place like a synagogue is not the first entry for them. So we tried to do, we tried to be very colorful everything. This is shots from the opening. Really tried, to, in other words, the idea of not only being a place where people who are already comfortable and feel okay being Jewish, but a place really for everybody. Internally, we have a logistic, there's a problem demographically, which I talked a little bit about, that you have older people, we have a very active senior club, the older people have always been Jewish and they're Jewish and they're in the building every day. To be honest, it's not a bad thing to be a senior, at least in Krakow, in Jewish Krakow, because they sit there and drink all day. It's not a very <laughs> bad life. And we have students, an active student program. In the middle is the difficult thing, because the people now that are, I don't know, a lot of you are young, but for me, I'll also put myself in the young son, but no, 40, 50, these are people that were pushed away from their, by their parents from Judaism. So those are the people now with families and children, it's difficult for us to attract them. So from community building point of view, there's a bit of a break. Um, and this for us is very, very, this, this is really a problem. And we're trying, we have a nursery, we have a uh, Sunday school, I should mention a few of the things. Belly dance we have, Shabbat dinner every week. But the elements are there in Krakow internally for, for a real Jewish revival. What I, not a Jewish revival, a Jewish Jewish revival. So not only interest in people, 10,000 people at the Jewish festival listening to klezmer music, but actual Jews, which or people that have some Jewish roots and want to find their way back in. Internally, everything is there in Krakow. We have all of this. We have a very secure situation. We have an intact city, haha, <laughs> Warsaw, an intact, sorry, an intact Jewish community, an intact Jewish uh, neighborhood. We have seven synagogues, Jewish community center, Jewish cultural center, Jewish museum, and we have no security issues. In other words, these days, more and more in the world, when there's metal detectors in any Jewish building, those of you are people here from Berlin, there are arm, you know, soldiers in front of most in, 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 in Germany. There are, actually all over Europe, you have the situation now with security. In Krakow, we don't feel any of those things, so we feel very lucky and very, very safe there. Um, the problem, though, is not only in Poland do people see these photos, these black and white photos, as what, what, what the situation, Jewish situation in Poland, like this is how the outside world sees it as well, and certainly the Jewish world. You have a lot of Jewish tourism that comes through Krakow, and they call it heritage tours which is an interesting word to me, the, the euphemism, and certainly euphemistically looking at the word heritage, is that they come to Poland, go from Majdanek to Treblinka to Auschwitz, maybe a few minutes at rock on over to Schindler's factory, now a little bit at the ghetto, and then fly back. And to me, this is, this is a very difficult thing. I make a point sometimes and think about the idea of a second, gener second generation Japanese American who would want to go on a heritage tour of Japan. His father was the first generation born, live in San Francisco, let's say, the large Japanese population. His father decides to take him back to go see the old country to explore the heritage. They land in Tokyo, take a bus to Hiroshima, back to Nagasaki, from Nagasaki to the airport, and then get on a flight back. But to us, this, the, the idea that that's heritage would be obscene to us. Yet in the Jewish world, the idea that going from camp to camp, to ghetto to camp, to cemetery, is heritage is, is accepted, or has been accepted, and we're very much trying, trying to change that. And that for us is really one of our largest, an important mission, one of our largest missions, and most difficult, because internally all the elements are there now in Krakow for a strong, resurgent, vibrant Jewish community, but we're still small enough that we have to, we need to connect to the outside world. And this is really something for us that's, that's important. I will say that, People question, certainly after building the center, you have no Jews there, what do they do in building the center? Ha ha, Prince Charles, build it in Warsaw, who cares? All of these things we hear. But I think that we in Krakow have a, a special mission, not only in the Jewish world, but in the, larger, in, in, in the larger world, which is because it's near Auschwitz and because of the special difficulties and because so many tourists come through Krakow and so many of them are going to Auschwitz. And I think the idea that somebody can spend the day, spend the morning, the day in Auschwitz-Birkenau and feel what they feel, not only from the Jewish point of view, because for me it's larger than a Jewish question. I think what happened there is, a, you know, on a, on a level, we, we question humanity itself. And I think the idea that you can go and see what happened there and go see the crematoria, and then later in the afternoon walk past the Jewish community center 
in this community that have been so completely destroyed and decimated by the war and see Sunday school, Jewish weddings, or one Jewish wedding, um, to be able to go to Krakow and to see this, I think, makes you understand, oh, there we go, some more of the parties, makes you understand that not only does Jewish life go on after a tragedy like the Holocaust, but in general, life goes on. Thank you. Mazel tov. Toda. <laughs> All I can say is uh, the response in, in this room is p possibly an indication of uh, just how important a subject uh, a conversation like this uh, is. Um, now, you're going to have to uh, spend time with Michal here and talk about uh, stories because uh, it seems to me that there are a lot of stories that need to be transferred from generation to generation. Interestingly, though, very often the generation in the middle gets skipped because it's the grandpa telling the stories to the, the young ones. Um, how does that work in, uh, you know, at the center? I think the main challenge is that these stories, while it's a good thing that these stories are being told from grandparents to grandchildren, that the children are excluded. So interestingly, at the center we have a um, very strong senior program and we have a Sunday school and nursery. So we, last year on Grandparents Day, we wanted to do something and have grandparents go to, go to the cinema with the grandchildren. So we did this. The only problem was that grandchildren, grandparents went with grandchildren just with someone else's grandchildren because these people's families weren't really involved. So the necessity of telling these stories not, and to, keep, you know, to build a community, you need really every generation involved. And if you skip a generation, it breaks the chain. So we're trying to rebuild those missing links in that chain. Thank you. Thank you.